I have been assured that you are out there, though I sadly cannot see or hear you. So this is a little bit of a disconcerting experience for me. But uh, uh, I really appreciate you all listening in, and I hope you enjoy this talk about uh, my new book, The Design Activist Handbook. And uh, I, I should say that I'm a bit remiss in saying my book is actually co-written by me and Michelle Towdy, uh, but Michelle is not able to join us today, so I'm going to be speaking for both of us. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was give you a little background on how this book came to exist. And then I'll go ahead and tell you a bit about what's in it and what it's all about. But uh, the backstory will help you understand why this book has come into existence. Um, so I always like to start with a quote from Howard Zinn. And if you're not a fan of Howard Zinn's already, I hope you will research who he is. Uh, he was a wonderful teacher and writer. Uh, he wrote a book called the People's, a, a People's History of the United States, uh, which is fantastic. This quote, however, comes from from his autobiography, uh, You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. And he really sums up how I feel about life and work. And I always use this quote when I get talks, and so I was happy that I could include it in the book as well. And I think you know, the introduction here of the, of the book itself uh, is basically a clear statement of what I'm trying to talk about uh, in the book and also do with my own life and work. So first things first, I've got to give you a little background on myself. So I, I'm an artist, an author, within a graphic designer for many, many years, um, and I had uh, run a company called Another Limited Rebellion, uh, which is a socially conscious design and consulting firm, and I will tell you more about it in a little bit, but uh, first about my childhood. Uh, not too much, but um, hopefully this uh, is a familiar image to some of you. Um, I grew up in the 70s, uh, and I was the child of two artists, and my parents, or my mother especially, was an activist, and so I was raised to uh, believe that I could make change, uh, that I could impact the world and do good things and make a difference. And one of the things that would happen is my mom would take me to uh, protest marches uh, in the 70s uh, as a child in a stroller, and eventually I would come on my own uh, in, on roller skates, and I uh, basically did this my whole life. Uh, so this was a button that I actually used to own. Sadly, I don't have it anymore, but this is um, for marches that I was in in the 70s. And uh, this, hopefully you know what it is, but I, honestly I've done a, a survey in many of the... Um, talks I've given, and not many people do. And so if you're not familiar with it, the ERA was the Equal Rights Amendment, and it was for equal rights for women uh, to have a constitutional amendment saying that women should be uh, treated the same as men. Uh, and sadly, they never passed, actually, which is, which is amazing and still in this day and age. Um, so that was the kind of stuff I was involved in as a child. And so, I, you know, again, I was raised believing that you, you have to do stuff to make your voice heard, to make a difference, to reach out. Uh, and, and it has stayed with me my entire life. So I really appreciate uh, that my, my, my parents fostered that within me. Um, and you'll see how that applies to what I'm doing now in a little while. Um, this is actually the first piece of uh, graphic design I may have ever done. This was actually when I was in college. Um, I went to college to study theater design and not graphic design, even though my father taught graphic design uh, at Virginia Commonwealth University here in Richmond, Virginia, where, where I live now and where I grew up. Uh, for He taught there for 36 years, uh, and so somehow I didn't want to be a graphic designer. But I did want to work in the theater because I was interested in behind the scenes and making things happen. And, and in college, I discovered that I actually liked um, making some props, including this one for a play uh, where they needed a book cover, and I actually made some posters as well. And I was like, well, this is really fun, and I like this better than theater design. I wonder what this job is. Uh, and of course, this job was actually graphic design. So got out of school with a theater design degree and immediately became a graphic designer, uh, much to my father's chagrin. But happily, uh, everyone was supportive of that change. Um, and I'm going to give you just a little quick history of some of the things I did out of school. All of this, I promise you, will make sense and add up to something important. Um, but as I said, I studied theater design. I got out and became a graphic designer. And um, you know, went to work doing things like this. This is a poster I designed, and actually a logo on the poster I designed as well, for uh, a movie company called Troma. And, and they're not as, as well known now as they were then, but they were um, a, a, a sort of a Z movie company. And they're famous for the Toxic Avenger and Class of Newcomb High. Uh, and uh, so I got to cut my design teeth by working uh, in-house uh, uh, on these posters and, and, and uh, mailers, and a whole bunch of really interesting projects, and learn on the job, which was really great for me. Uh, and I did this for about a year and a half, and then I ended up working for a company called uh, Averex, which was a clothing company that also was a bit more well-known back in the 90s, but not as well-known now. 
Uh, but they did a lot of hip hop clothing. Uh, so I, I was designing graphics that went on t-shirts and jackets, and I got to meet some really cool people and learn about that industry. So I was learning graphic design on the job uh, for a couple different companies that I thought were you know doing okay stuff, but not necessarily what I wanted to do. Um, and I was freelancing doing the entire this entire time doing what I wanted to do, which was um, mostly actually design work for theater companies. Um, but in the course of this process of getting jobs and being out of school and looking for work, I, I realized that there was an issue. And, and the issue had to do with um, going back to my childhood, this idea of activism and doing good. Uh, and I said to people, you know, I want to do a job where I do good uh, in my life and, and not just spend my whole day working uh, and then trying to make up for it on the evenings and weekends by trying to do good things. Uh, there's got to be a way to, to do good uh, during the day. And, and when I put that out to people, they were like, this is crazy. I mean, this is just, you don't, you can't do that, actually. It's impossible. Um, what you have to do is you get a job, and then you work all day, and you make your money, and then you, you do what you can to, to rectify uh, that situation. And, and I always thought, well, this is, this is pretty bad, because basically, at best, you're going to balance out, and, and most likely, you're never going to actually make up for the bad you do all day at whatever job with the good you try to do on your evenings and weekends. So I was really disappointed with, with this idea of here's how the world's going to work. And so I made this chart, which I put in the book, and I'll show you the second half of the chart in a second. But, you know, this is how I had a, how I sort of pictured my day, you know, eight, eight hours of work, eight hours of sleep, and then eight hours to make a difference. And, uh, you know, that's not even realistic in terms of, obviously, the actual amount of time people have to put towards that. But I really wanted to make a chart that looked like this. Um, this is my you know, very technical chart here. Uh, but I, I I put it out there, you know, this is this is what I want to do. And, and as I said, people just thought it was nuts. And uh, happily, when people tell me you can't do something or it's impossible, my tendency is to say, well, you know what, I'm going to do it anyway, and I'll, sh I'll prove you wrong. Um, and luckily, I had that instilled in me. And again, maybe it's because of my, my upbringing. Um, but a lot of people don't have that. And so, you know, I thought, well, not only am I going to do this, I'm going to do this in a way that shows other people it's possible to do this. So a little more about my background, just real quickly, is that um, I was also involved in the punk rock scene uh, in the 90s as well. And you know, as part of that aesthetic is, is, is an activist component. And um, this is a quote from, as it says, Minor Threat. And if you're not familiar with them, they were a hardcore band out of DC. Um, now they are uh, members of the band went on to form Fugazi, which maybe is well, more well known. But again, when I do a, my talks about this at college level, uh, most people don't know who they are anymore, nor do they know Troma or Averex, so I, I'm definitely feeling my age. But uh, what I liked about the punk rock aesthetic was that there was, uh, there was an activism component, but there's also a sort of a self-awareness and a humor to it, and so uh, I liked the fact that they were you know, recognizing that they only you know, can do so much, but you're still going to try to do it, and that was my mindset. And so I started my company uh, and named it Another Limited Rebellion as, as a joke. It was really a sort of a way to thumb my nose at you know the corporate world, and I actually incorporated it. So it's another limited rebellion incorporated, uh, which I just think is hilarious. And when I get uh, credit card you know offers to another limited rebellion, it just I don't know, it amuses me to no end. Uh, so I started my company uh, actually unofficially, you know, sort of as a, um, a freelance thing right out of college. So I was doing graphic design for freelance clients, you know, consistently since I got out of school. Um, and develop this business slowly on the side. I'm going to do this socially consciously. I'm going to do this um, you know, from my ethical perspective. I'm going to do work uh, that makes me feel good, that does good for the world, and still somehow uh, makes me a living and, and, and you know, puts food on my table and keeps a roof over my head. Uh, and so it was really an experiment. And it was set up as an experiment to prove a point, uh, but also had to be a practical thing to be realistic about. Um, and so I did uh, work for those other companies for about six years. And then in uh, the beginning of 2001, I quit my job as a full-time designer working for other people and art director and started another limited rebellion as a full-time business and actually moved from New York City where I'd gone for school and work and back to Richmond, Virginia, uh, my home base. Um, so I you know, started this company. I, I set out to do this in 2001. And here I am today, and I'm still doing it. Uh, so that's a good sign. And um, so part of why I created this book was because I needed to uh, share some of what uh, uh, my experiences were with other people because, again, as part of this is, is to, to show people it's possible. I wanted to reach the largest audience possible uh, with that. And uh, this image from the preface to the book, which talks a, a bit about all the things I just talked about just now, uh, includes this image I created uh, actually for a talk I did uh, several years ago at Howe. Um, and it, it sort of sums up a metaphor I, I try to use when I think about why it is important that designers uh, choose to work from an ethical perspective. 
And when I talk about socially conscious design, I mean, I, I use that term very specifically. I think it's really important. Um, I actually was having a discussion about this with some other people recently, and you know, those, those words are important, uh, both words, because I think a lot of people think, well, uh, you know, socially responsible, uh, environmentally responsible, those are some words that get thrown well, around as well. But socially conscious for me is really important because it's about an awareness and then making choices from that awareness. Um, and so I'm not asking people to have my set of values as much as I would like you to have them. I'm more interested in people working from whatever their personal set of values are uh, because I think if everyone did that, the world would be a better place uh, and it doesn't have to be everyone agrees with me about it. But my perspective about designers uh, working from an ethical per perspective is, is this image of this megaphone versus this gun and that, you know, we have this very powerful skill. All of the communications we encounter in our world today, a designer has had uh, touched at some point. So we've got access to a lot, but at the same time we're invisible. And when I ask my students often about, you know, what do their parents think of their job? Do they know what they do? I mean, it, it, very often it's not clear. People don't know what designers do. They're invisible. The most famous designers that you know, uh, most people have never heard of. Um, they can walk down the street and not be bothered. Uh, so it, it is this weird uh, fame uh, for the things they create often and not who they are. So it's an interesting place to be powerful and invisible. Um, and so you can choose as this powerful and invisible individual to be a hired gun, that you can basically be the person uh, that is uh, told, you know, here's, here's your target, uh, aim your weapon at it and fire, and we'll pay you gobs of money to do that. That sounds good. Uh, and for a lot of people that's fine and that's good, but I think because of people doing that with, for so long without questioning, we've ended up in the situation where we are now where a lot of communications are really, you know, making people feel bad about themselves, um, encouraging people to spend money they don't have, uh, creating a culture that is not necessarily the one that I'd like to live in, um, and, and, and leading towards, uh, you know, a consumer society and creating a lot more waste uh, and stuff we are having to deal with now as, as the situation continues to get worse because we don't have more resources. So there's a lot of reasons for uh, uh, rejecting this model of just doing whatever somebody says and pointing you towards something and just using your, your powerful skill just to get paid. Uh, and to choose instead to be a megaphone. Uh, and the megaphone's role, of course, is to amplify voices. And so I'm encouraging people to, to choose people whose voices are worthy to them of being amplified. That, you know, the question is, uh, who's, who do you want to help? And, and, and you know, we live in a very uh, diluted, uh, or not diluted, I should say, very um, busy uh, environment in terms of visuals, in terms of messages. Uh, you know, everybody's out there speaking to you in a variety of ways, and it's just become more and more congested. And so the question of how to sort of raise above this uh, visual din, this visual congestion, and, and, and single out a voice and single out a message that's important. And, and so that's a great thing for us to do, and especially if we do that for people who are doing things that make our world better, make our communities better. Uh, and so that's really the challenge that I'm offering uh, designers and I've tried to, to you know, work on myself. Um, so to give you a little more perspective on how this book came to be, um, I teach a class called Design Rebels, and I actually created this class in uh, 2002 for Virginia Commonwealth University uh, here in Richmond. Uh, and my dad, as I said, was teaching there, and he hired me as an adjunct teacher to teach some basic classes of uh, you know, software use. And I said, you know, no one's talking about this stuff that's, that's really interesting to me and that I'm trying to do with my company. Uh, you know, could I come into schools and teach this? And, and VCU happily said, sure, whatever you want. Uh, and really just left me to my, uh, my own devices, which was great. And so I uh, created this class um, just on, on my own based on the things I was doing, the things I was teaching uh, myself and sharing it with these students. And so I started doing that, as I said, in 2002. And a couple of years later, I was like, you know, this, is, this would be great to get out in a, in a bigger way. And so this is now the re real genesis of this book. I, I basically um, thought this would be great. I reached out to a friend of mine named John Emerson, who's a wonderful designer who has been involved in uh, socially conscious design for a long time. And so we started discussing the concept of a book. Uh, both of us were too busy to really make a progress of it. And then um, sort of just sat there and gelled while I continued to, to teach my class uh, and do my own work. And I'm uh, just showing you a few images from the class. These are some projects that my students have done. They were all required to go out into the community with a real world project based on the sort of the topic of socially conscious design and things that we discussed, the gray areas of, of ethical responsibility for designers. Uh, and so every semester for, since that uh, first class, my students have gone into the community in a variety of ways. So this is them talking to uh, middle school or high school students. Um, this is them doing a program about, about local food uh, for the community. This is them uh, doing a project about raising uh, materials for homeless people, uh, and they did a really fun art project as part of that. Uh, and this was one that they did about uh, a 
obviously waste and re waste reduction as a community art uh, piece that, that raised awareness. So, um, you know, this is some really cool stuff they were doing. I was glad to reach this audience, this crowd, but I was really thinking, how can I, you know, get it to the next level? And so this book became the, the concept around which I thought maybe uh, this is, you know, this is where it can happen. Um, so as I said, I, I started this idea back in 2005 and then uh, basically didn't get very far on it and, and shelved it. And then I had a really wonderful time uh, being interviewed by this woman, Michelle. And uh, at the end of my interview, this was for a magazine, it was about the topic of socially conscious design. And at the end of the interview, I said, hey, you know, I've been looking to write this book and it's just not something I can write on my own because I just feel uh, very overwhelmed by the topic. It's, it's something I think a lot about. It's something I work on all the time. And because of my closeness to it, I feel like I have a, a hard time um, talking to other people maybe that aren't already engaged or interested in it. Uh, and so Michelle said, sure, I'm game. And so we started this process, and I think the oldest email I just found about this was back in 2007. So uh, here we are in 2012, and it's finally come out as a book. So it's been a very long, arduous journey, uh, and I'm very happy uh, to finally have this be in a, a physical format uh, that everyone can see, and I'm very happy with how it came out. So. Um, I guess what I'm going to do now is switch over to talking a bit about the book itself uh, and just talk about the contents of it. And basically, um, the, the book is designed to be a functional document. I really didn't want it to be something that would be um, just put on a shelf or just put on a coffee table and be, look at these pretty projects. And so it was really meant to be something practical. Um, the, the, you know, the idea of it being a handbook, the title, which I think is you know, I think it's appropriate. And then, the, you know, even the subtitle, How to Change the World, or at least your part of it with Socially Conscious Design. And really, you know, you and your being in the title of this idea of that, that this is for you. This is a manual. This is for you to use and to do things with. Uh, and so um, the book is broken into a few main chunks. And you saw already that there's the, I showed the little the sort of introduction, some of the introduction and some of the preface that I wrote. And there's also a wonderful uh, beginning part written by David Berman, and if you're not familiar with him, he's uh, from Canada, he's a designer, and he talks about uh, socially conscious design, and actually has his own book called Do Good Design. Um, and so, you know, his book really covered a lot of the philosophical stuff and the reason to, to sort of have to sort of the ethical piece of this. And so I wanted to, this book to really fit in uh, to a continuity of books that are existing now happily about this topic. Because I'll tell you, when I, when I started talking to people about this uh, back, like I say, in the, in the 90s, and even in the early 2000s, uh, this just was a topic that, that there was some interest in, but it was brief, and it was sort of like, oh, we wrote our articles about it, and then people were like, and now on to the next subject. And, and uh, so there was sort of a handful of people who really were sort of continuing to, to carry this flag of socially conscious design over the last decade. And, and so I was really excited when I encountered David and, and saw that he was putting out a book about this, and that you know, that's a book now that I use in my, in my Design Rebels class to talk to students about um, the ethical piece of it. So, like I say, I think this book was really meant to follow that continuity and be the book that um, then helped you figure out how to actually do it and not just think about it and not just look at pretty pictures of other people doing it, but how can you do it for real. Uh, and as part of that, one of the things that I, that I was really adamant about uh, work, when I worked on this book was that all of the people that we, we talked to about submitting work for it, that we really encouraged it, and of course I'm showing you a page that doesn't have that on it, but really encouraged that the majority of the projects that we showed were not pro bono but really projects that were either self-directed because people wanted to do them or they were paid work. Because you know, one of the things that's really important to me is that if we're going to make this a realistic thing, that, that socially conscious design is sort of becomes the de facto way of working, that working from an ethical perspective is the way that we work and not just sort of a side thing, um, it's got to be practical. So you've got to be able to make a living doing it. And so this book is very much aimed at that, uh, that, that with that mindset of like, you know, this is something you can do. Uh, and so how will you be able to do this? Well, uh, you got to be able to make money doing it, or you have to be able to do it in a way that um, allows you to make money doing something else. Um, and like I said, with my chart from before, I want that to apply to everyone. I, I really am a, a, a big advocate of, of showing people a way of life that is um, possible for others to do, and not just because of my own unique circumstances. Um, and so I said, uh, we really sort of de-emphasize the pro bono thing, not that it's something that you should never do, but that if it's the way that we do socially conscious design work, then yeah, it'll always be a side thing and never become the, the main way of working. Um, so after we get sort of through that preliminary stuff and we get to the, the sort of meat of it, there's, there's basically five big chapter chunks. Uh, and the first is this toolbox. And I really wanted to get people up to speed uh, with the, the concept of socially conscious design and activism as a designer and what that means. And I love starting with this piece um, about where uh, designers can fit into the electoral uh, process in America 
Uh, and this obviously was developed after the 2000 election, but here we are about to hit another election, so the, the timing is quite appropriate. Um, and so we talk about sort of in the, in the first couple of sections. And, I, oh, and let me back up for a moment and just say that, you know, in terms of the process of writing this, as I said, you know, Michelle and I worked together, and, and, and basically what happened is that Michelle would interview me. I sort of told her, here's the big topics I want to talk about, and then she interviewed me uh, about these subjects, and then she wrote the, the, the bulk of the chapters, and then we edited them together, and then we collected all the other materials, and I wrote a few essays. So she really did the, the majority of the writing, which was great, because it was her able to synthesize what I was saying and make it in a really clear voice that I think the you know, general audience, the non-activists, could understand and appreciate and, and easily make use of. And she was able to really say to me, this isn't clear, or this is something that, uh, you know, uh, you need to, to add more examples of, or whatever it was, that it was a, she was a wonderful sounding board and a great way to get these ideas that were in me out onto paper. And I, I loved reading her writing and her interpretation of it. So um, that said, uh, the first part I was saying is, is broken down into a series of tools. And so the first is recognizing design's power. And so we talk about the first things first manifesto. And if you're not familiar with that, uh, you, will, you can be if you look at it in the book. Um, but the, there's sort of the, the 2000 version, the 1999 actually version, of it that got published and sort of where I was coming into uh, my own interest in social conscious design and discovering there were other people was encountering that document. So we were able to reproduce the one from the 60s that sort of talks about the beginnings of, of this uh, current social conscious design movement. Um, and I give a little bit of a history too, and it's something I do in my class, is talk about the idea of design and activism and, and where it resides in, in sort of the longer continuity of art and design uh, in the world. And so to say that, you know, this isn't just something coming out of the blue, but there's a, there's a tradition of it. Um, the second tool we talk about is claiming your power. Uh, and so this is sort of talking about this idea of, of uh, starting to think critically about the work you do. We actually have a couple of charts that show sort of how much uh, ethical consideration there is even in something simple like a brochure design. And, and so we we, we sort of show the whole process of, of what goes into it and where designers can have an influence in the choices that they make. Um, I think a lot of times we think of designers or a lot of times designers are thought of as sort of cogs in a bigger machine. You're not the usually the, the person who's deciding the project should happen. Uh, usually you're a commercial artist who has a client telling you what to do. And so it's great to have somebody um, uh, you know, telling you to do something good, but if they're not, you know, what do you choose to do as that? Do you just continue to move or do you turn in the other direction? Do you stop the machine and stand up and say this is you know, wrong? And so we're saying you have an opportunity to do that, that you can make it, you, you can raise your voice and make it heard. Um, and the third is designing, it's defining uh, professional ethics, the third tool we talk about. Uh, and we give some examples of, of that and also I include uh, sort of some of my favorite publications um, that I like to look at for inspiration and research on this subject. Chapter two is sort of where we get into the sort of the three big ways you can go about being a socially conscious designer as I break it down. And the first is the easiest uh, and also the hardest at the same time. Um, but basically saying that, you know, uh, if you do, if you set out to do your own uh, company, you're going to have the most freedom to set that company up the way you want it to be. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not for everybody. I've enjoyed running my own business for a long time. There's a the sense of freedom that comes with it that's incredible that I really uh, wouldn't trade for anything, but I know not everybody wants to. But I want to, you know, we start off with that because I think that's the, you know, the way that I did it and the way that I think can be incredibly effective. And really, what we go through is sort of the basics of, of kind of how you make some decisions about being a socially conscious design firm, or you know, editor, or even freelance socially conscious designer, and, and what you can do in terms of who your clients are um, and what kind of work you do. And I've always emphasized with my own company that you know it doesn't necessarily limit you uh, to do that. Um, you know, even though I call myself a socially conscious design firm, it doesn't mean that I'm only working for the crunchy granola, uh, you know, hippie company. I'm working for a variety of companies, um, and my definition for that is actually a philosophy that I have on my website. Uh, but basically, it's like, you know, I have a series of things I'm not willing to do because of my ethics, and there's a thing, series of things that I'd like to do because of my ethics. And then, you know, who fits into those categories? Well, really, for me, I define the type of clients I work with as anyone who is doing uh, something positive for the community that, that they're located with. So I don't even have to necessarily work with a local business, just as long as the business is doing good for their own community. So it's pretty broad. Um, at the same time, it's a niche, uh, but it's a great niche to be in. I, I basically I get asked frequently whether I've limited myself uh, in terms of clients and do I turn down a lot of work. And it turns out that um, not much, because you know generally people don't come to me uh, if 
they're doing something that's probably not my interest because they, they know it because I put it out there, and so I don't have to spend a lot of time saying no to people. Uh, but also people come to me specifically because they know I'm doing socially conscious design and that I uh, you know, have a knowledge of this, that I've spent time doing this, I have energy towards it. Um, so there's a really a lot of benefit from being uh, in this niche of socially conscious design, though I, I should say I would really like it not to be a niche. I really think eventually this should be the way that people work. Um, and I think we're starting to see this in, in sort of the corporate world. If you just, you know, pretty much every business at this point, every big business has some um, wing to it that, that's devoted to focusing on a socially responsible uh, business practice of some sort or environmental practices. And I think, you know, the smart businesses know that regardless of what they produce, that they need to be thinking this from an environmental perspective at least, if not a social perspective, because it will come back to haunt them as we you know, continue to have uh, fewer resources and as other things continue to affect their ability to, to make a profit, you know, frankly. Um, so, you know, the, like I said, this, this, this going alone chapter is very, from a, very much a business perspective and a business person's perspective. Um, and the next section is sort of taking it even beyond sort of doing this idea of, uh, you know, running your own socially conscious design firm but still working for other clients to just why not making your own projects from scratch. Why do you have to have clients? Um, it's certainly easier to have clients, and I, I, you know, obviously they call you and they pay you money, and uh, then you do work. That's a pretty good uh, system. Um, but I've actually been finding myself moving more in this direction personally, which is to say, you know, could you start your own projects? Could you create things uh, that accomplish your goals, and you don't have to have an outside source doing that? Of course, you still need to find a way to make it uh, financially viable, but um, there are a variety of ways you can do that, um, whether that's getting grants or raising funds on things, places like Kickstarter. Um, so there's a variety of op uh, options for that. And, and one of the people we actually talked to uh, and interviewed for the book were um, these people who have a company uh, called Squishy Press. And they actually um, were looking for books, uh, for children's books that were non-toxic, and they couldn't find them. There were a couple of designers, and so they decided, well, why don't we just make our own? And so they went from being you know, designers to, to, to book publishers. Uh, and have uh, you know successfully been been doing that now as their way of, of accomplishing their goals and making the products that they want to see actually exist in the world. Um, the next chunk may be the most realistic for a lot of people, and so that's why it was important that we include it in the book. Um, I think you know one of the things that's happened to me as an, a an activist as a, a, a throughout my life is that people will tend to say, well, you know, you didn't do this perfectly, uh, so you've, you've not succeeded in it. And there's a real weird attitude about sort of activism and about doing good uh, that somehow uh, if you don't do it exactly right, if you're not perfect about it, that you failed and that it's not worth doing at all, which is a real shame because obviously it's the little things that add up to make the difference in the world and make the changes. Uh, and so when you do these small things, um, uh, any amount of it can really help and add up. You know, I always say like it's all the grain, individual grains of sand don't look like much, but they make a beach. Or even better, uh, you know, individual piece of paper are pretty flimsy, but uh, you know, you don't really want somebody to hit you with a book. Uh, so it's pretty substantial when they, all these little pieces come together. Um, so working on the inside is an important thing. It was actually also the hardest chapter for us to find examples for because sadly um, there's still this attitude in the corporate world of, of keeping stuff secret. Of, of you know not sharing their information and hopefully um, we'll encourage a change in that. But happily, a few businesses were willing to come forward and let us talk to them and and share some information about how they run their business. Um, because it turns out a lot of businesses, as I said, do care about these issues, um, but not all of them. Uh, but there are a lot of people within them, and, and we have to remember that these businesses uh, are made up of individuals. And a lot of times when I talk about the corporate world of corporations, and we we think of the Fortune 500 and the giant big businesses and all these you know maybe all these bad things. And, and the reality is like obviously every you know, every corporate business is a corporation. I have a, my company, a design firm is a corporation. Um, and every nonprofit is a form of corporation too. So, you know, part of it is also thinking about that business means a lot of things. Um, but that, you know, it, it's what we're trying to say is really that you can work from within a company uh, and make changes. And, and they may be small. I mean, they may not be the, the massive change you'd like. And that's why we encourage that people go off and, and, and start their own businesses or, or do their own projects as well to really have a big impact. But I always say, you know, these walls that we're trying to tear down, to, to they're really going to fall down faster if we're picking at them from both sides. And so, you know, it, it, we need people to be the activists on the outside. We need people to be the activists on the inside. And when both sides do that, we really are going to make a change. Um, so, like I say, happily, there were some people who were willing to talk to us about how they were doing it. And, and I also talk about my own experiences, as I said, working for um, Averex and uh, Troma Films. 
you know, when I was doing that, I still did have my set of ethics, and I didn't want to hang up uh, my ethics on the coat rack when I walked in the door. And so for me, it was really a question of how, where do I have an opportunity for influence within this business? And so sometimes it was just the materials that I could purchase because I had a certain ability within my uh, department to buy things so I could buy the materials that were more eco-friendly. Or sometimes when I was designing materials, I could actually encourage them to, to do things that were better. Um, but the way I would do it is that it would save them money. You know? And of course, that's how the language of business is money. And, and happily, um, the sort of the big ideas of, of socially conscious design, especially when it comes to the uh, environmental component of it, actually are really uh, money savers. So when you think about the, the three R's, the reduce, reuse, and recycle, um, all three of those can be money savers. I mean, sadly, in the old days, it was like if you wanted to recycle paper, it cost more. Uh, and it was really funny that, that it sort of was an expensive thing to do, but it makes no sense. Uh, so happily, that's, you know, that kind of paper is more prevalent. But beyond that, you know, the more important stuff, instead of the recycle, is the reduce and reuse. And both of those are very easily seen uh, right away as money savers. So producing less of something, uh, you spend less money on it. And, and um, reusing things, that means you won't, don't buy more stuff to replace it. And so that's really where the, the sort of designer working on the inside has an opportunity for influence, because you can use your skills to say, look, here's a better piece that's more functional and, and cost you less. And, creates less waste. And so sometimes the business only understands the financial piece of it. And so you're going to basically say, here's what's good about doing it this way. And some people will say, actually, they do care about the environmental piece, but the financial piece is what helps them push you through and get the decisions made by the higher ups. Um, so it's learning how to you know, speak in the language of business and understand you know, what these business uh, people are looking for. But, but also remembering ultimately that they're all human beings and individuals and that they still need to breathe and uh, still need to live in this world, and so they probably would like a world that's better uh, from a variety of ways as well. Um, I, I will just make a note that you know I've talked a lot about the environmental piece, but but notice that you know I, again from the beginning I've been talking about socially conscious design because it's it's more than just the environmental piece, and there's plenty of good books about sort of environmentalism and about uh, making you know green choices in terms of your your production, and we advocate that, but that's not a new major focus of the book, because I think it's been talked about by a lot of people, but I'm really more interested in the bigger picture of sort of us living together on this planet, and, and, and part, of that, uh, is, part of that puzzle is the environmental piece, but that there's a lot more to it, and so whether you're thinking about uh, human rights, uh, whether you're thinking about you know, workers' rights, whether you're thinking about um, a, a variety of different issues that, that can impact you as a, as a person in this world, that's where really the socially conscious designer resides. Um, so, you know, it would be nothing if we didn't give people some, you know, beyond just some basic information and interviews with people who are doing these things for real, but like a real practical plan of action. So chapter five really just outlines some big ideas for things you could start doing right away. So we include actually six uh, big ideas. Um, one of them is, is about getting your own project started with uh, you know, crowdsourced funds. Uh, another is finding collaborators to work with, uh, diagramming how you work, uh, doing the work that you want to do rather than um, you know, waiting around for people to, to, to pay you for it. Uh, and, and one of the projects we include, in fact, is, is something I did in the last few years, and, and maybe some of you are familiar with it, but I did a project called Skull a Day, and it, it's sort of this really random out there thing that doesn't seem to relate to everything we're talking about here, but it was really a way for me to start doing my own thing uh, and showing people what I was capable of, and because of doing that, I've gotten a lot of really incredible opportunities, and so we actually talk about people making a daily commitment to doing the things they want to do, because by doing that, it does add up and, and make for... Uh, the opportunities that, that you want to have happen, because now you're showing people uh, that you can do it and that it's possible. And um, so I wanted to show you the sort of other chunks that are in the book. Um, we have interviews at the end of each chapter in each section uh, with other people who are actually doing this stuff. I think it's really important, again, to know that this is practical and not theoretical. Uh, and so obviously James Victoria is a pretty well-known designer, but I, I've always enjoyed his, his sort of uh, no BS attitude and the sort of straight talk about doing this and he's somebody who has uh, you know run his own design firm and now he's actually making products and not you know working less with clients so he's actually doing a lot of what we've talked about in there um, some of the other people that we interview in the book are um, uh, Elon Cole who was at the time was working for Johnson & Johnson so he was working on the inside which is a very interesting perspective to get um, we also talked to uh, Jonas Sachs, who is one of the two people that founded Free Range in Washington, D.C., which is a very successful firm, uh, very most maybe well known for their the Matrix videos, but also they've been doing the um, videos recently that have been getting a lot of uh, play, the story of stuff, uh, which are excellent if you've never seen them, worth, worth looking up. Um, we also interviewed uh, Mark Randall from the World Studio and Ennis Carter from uh, used to be designed for social impact, now it's social impact studios. Uh, so a range of folks. 
that, that are really cool people doing cool stuff, doing it for real, and have some great advice uh, that way. Um, the other thing that we wanted to make sure to include in the book, and, and why I think, you know, here also is something to think about, is like, you know, the, the question always comes up, why do you have a physical book? You know, why do you make print on paper and waste all these materials? And, and that is a question for anybody who produces a book about these issues, because you have to really say, you know, would, this be, would we be better off with less stuff? Uh, and, and generally, I would agree, and there's certainly a certain cachet and appeal to having a physical objects. I like to have real books. I'm, I'm, I don't really like to read digital books. Um, but also, I think, you know, in this case, we really want this to be a book that's handled and written and used and flipped through and, and sort of present. And I think it's very easy for the digital books to not be present, to sort of disappear. And so we very consciously included these sections to write in at the end of each chapter that also encourage you to really think about the practical applications of what you just read. How, how could you apply these things? What, what could you do with them? right away, right now. Uh, and then you could also go back to the book as you've read it and documented it and sort of see where, where you are. And I've, I've found that a very useful step for myself, um, especially because a lot of times it's, it's one thing to think about stuff, and it's another thing to really clarify it by writing it down and being specific about it. And I found that I've always achieved my goals uh, when I was uh, been very specific uh, about them and have written them out. Uh, so we wanted to encourage people to do that in the book. And then the book itself ends with this uh, large section of uh, where you can um, sort of assess everything that you've read in the book and, and really spend several pages filling out sort of what your game plan is. So, you, you know, the idea is that you should leave this book ready uh, for action, ready to do things, and hopefully return to it again and again uh, and, and use it. And so we, we sort of follow that with um, a little section to make a specific commitment uh, and then a section of resources where there's tons of material that, that, you know, we didn't have time to mention or cover in the book because there's just so much of it out there. And of course it's constantly changing too, so of course the hard thing with, with the physical book is, um, like I said, this was something we were in the process of doing for a long time and, and that things are changing rapidly, but happily they're changing um, for the good uh, in, on the whole. Um, about, I think about two years ago I, I was on a phone call uh, and it was just sort of completely unrelated to, to design work. It was, you know, I think I was talking to some tech representative uh, about some problem I was having maybe with the internet or something. And, and I was on the phone and uh, this person answered and they said, what's the name of your company? And I said, oh, another limited rebellion. And they're, oh, well, what's that? And I said, well, well, you know, it's a socially conscious design firm. And, she, and, and what was cool is that this, this person who was, you know, had this random job to answer the phone and talk about technical problems was like, oh, uh, is that like sort of doing stuff from, you know, uh, ethical perspective or as a business and I was like yeah actually that is and, and it was amazing because I, I have to say that like again when I started it in um, you know, full time in 2001 but in the 90s especially when I was talking about these ideas it was just you know absolutely unheard of and people really were like this is nuts and so happily this is coming out right now in an environment where this isn't nuts and where people do kind of get it and people are more understanding so there's a lot more potential and possibility for people that are choosing this per this way of mode of working uh, to really actually enact it. And so I'm very happy about that because, again, I do a lot of talks about this and very frequently students afterwards go, okay, I'm on board, um, you know, where can I go work now? And, and, you know, there are really only still a small handful of studios that are doing socially conscious design as a full-time practice and they don't have huge staffs. They, you know, some of them have decent sized staffs, but they're certainly not going to be hiring every student that comes out of school. And so, they're, they're, you know, there's a great need for people to be doing this and enacting this themselves, but at least the sort of soil seems more uh, fertile for it right now. So I feel like, you know, this book in many ways is sort of hopefully a rallying cry, hopefully um, finding people who are sort of already getting this idea and sort of already interested, um, but want to, uh, you know, in, get involved, make a difference, make a change, make a choice to, to, to start doing this for real. Uh, and so as part of that, um, I was really happy that How Let Me Do This, but we actually included a little stencil, a real uh, die cut stencil in the front of the book. So there's this little flap because it's a, sort of a soft cover but it has a flap. And so instead of just writing some stuff on it, they let me put this uh, stencil so you could declare yourself as a design activist or at least use the Cross Wrenches logo, um, which is something that I actually um, made as a little icon for my socially conscious design work many, many, many years ago. In fact, in 2000, I think again it was about 2001, I went to a conference on um, the globalization and technology. And, and it was in this conference that I sat there going, this is really, really interesting and how could I apply this to socially conscious design? This, concept that was, you know, getting ready to start my company doing and thinking very hard about. And so I drew this icon, I drew this little cross wrenches, and it's, I've actually seen cross wrenches used in plenty of places, but I, I drew this out thinking, you know, here, here's a symbol that represents sort of this idea of the, the sort of the tool that also can be thrown into the gears and stop the machine if necessary. And so um, I, I ended up creating that icon and putting a little manifesto online. It was a, um, 
designers against monoculture is what I called it, uh, not monoculture plant planting, but monoculture in that you know sort of the, the creation of this sort of global monoculture of, of sort of uh, corporate consumerism rather than sort of the unique individual cultures of, of everyone's uh, community. And so I uh, put that out there and, and ended up creating a community and becoming part of a community of designers that were like-minded. And so I guess, you know, what was really cool is that, that, you know, when you encounter these things like this conference years ago and that here it is, the symbol is still uh, floating around that I made back then. I, you know, it's part of now this book that I, you know, I'm looking forward to putting into the world and having other people encounter and hopefully um, they'll take it forward and pick up the mantle and, and go to the next level with it and, and spread this message even further. Um, so. That's sort of the, the, the story of the book, the story of me. I, I hope you found it uh, interesting and elucidating. Um, I think uh, we've got some questions for me to answer. I think they reserve about 15 minutes. I'm, I'm actually stopping a little bit early, so hopefully we can actually take about 20 minutes to do, uh, answer some questions, assuming there are that many. But uh, I want to thank you very much for listening, and I hope that you do get a chance to, to pick up this book in, in person and, and check it out and, and send me an email. Uh, you see at the bottom of the screen, I've given you my email address. Feel free to write me. I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. I'm also on Twitter, which you can see on the right, and then my own design firm website if you want to see the kind of work that I've been doing in the last, uh, gosh, 12 years now. Um, definitely check it out. So thank you very much for uh, listening in. Thank you so much, Noah. That was great. And I think people will really enjoy how applicable and practical this book is to many types of designers. And we do have um, questions already lined up. Um, thank you to you know, all the listeners who submitted those, you know, both during the session and also when they were registering. So you can also use your question panel on the right to keep on entering questions. So, um, you know, go ahead and take advantage of that. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and start with um, this one question that uh, asks, where did you find the path of most, most resistance when developing and writing the book? Um, you know, a subject area, and I know that you kind of touched on that with Chapter 4, so um, I didn't... Where, where is that in your opinion? The, the path of most resistance in terms of um, just the ability to write it or in terms of the sort of content of it? I think that from the content perspective and just yeah. like really hammering down the subject matter. Yeah. I, you know, I, because it was something that I've been talking in, about and, and teaching about for a long time, I think the material was there. And I think more than anything, the hard part was sort of paring it down. I mean, that's why I needed a, a Michelle really to work with because I think it, it's such a daunting and big topic, and there's so much to it. And I really wanted to say everything ever about this because I think I'm super passionate about it. And so it's like, how can I uh, put it out there in this way that other people will be hopefully passionate about too? And so just just sort of getting down to the material that that, that is going to be the most effective and interesting and draw the most people into it and get them to think about and research the next piece. Because you know, I definitely find if you give people too much, it becomes overwhelming and they give up. And, and that if you can sort of give just enough, just that it's exciting and interesting, um, they can delve in further. And so that's a really hard thing to do with with a book. Also just, you know, the fact that we were collecting interviews uh, and material and, and images. I mean the whole book is filled with uh, visual examples as well. And that's just a ton of physical work. I mean just keeping track of it and making sure everybody's got credits. Uh, so, you know, books, books are a lot of work, uh, and, and this one especially because of its long uh, lead time in terms of that we started collecting these interviews and then uh, the book took a long time to produce and, and to get out. So, so it, it's a lot of energy, and I was, I was talking to the folks here earlier about, um, you know, that it, the other thing that happens when you finish a book is that then, then it disappears because it has to be printed and you sort of wait, and then it shows up again, and you're kind of like, oh, that thing, and then you realize nobody's ever seen it before except you and you know, whoever's been working on it. And so... Uh, it's a very odd experience, so I'm very excited for this book to, to, to now be a physical object that other people can see, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to what people think of it, and I, I, like I said, I would love the feedback on it, and uh, hopefully it'll lead to, you know, people to do some cool things. Well, you know, we're, we're very excited about it, too, and um, I, this question came in a, in a variety of different forms, so um, I'm going to go ahead and, and put it out there, um, and I know you touched on it, and um, but, you know, overall, and, and, you know, you've had years of experience doing this now, um, is it possible for a designer to be a philanthropist who very directly impacts society while still having a profitable career or successful business? So I think you're the right man to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's a good question, and, you know, I think the hard thing, I've had to talk to a lot of people about this, is, is what, what is your idea of success? 
and you know what's interesting is I have a friend of mine who's been a full-time uh, musician. He runs a music studio, um, and he does. You know, he basically does. He lives his dream every day, and yet he thinks he's a failure because you know he's not rich or he's not famous or whatever it is. And, and that I had to sit him down the other day and go, you know, that every single day you get up and do what you want to do, and I do the same thing every day. I get up and I do what I want to do. I mean, to a certain extent, of course, I have clients, so they do tell me what to do to some degree. But mostly, you know, I'm in control of that, and that that is an incredibly valuable thing. It's not like literal cash in hand, but I would not trade uh, my daily freedom for that cash in hand. Um, so, you know, understanding that, you know, it may be possible to be a super wealthy social conscious designer. I haven't met one yet who hasn't maybe already to sell super wealthy to begin with, but that, you know, that's not to mean that you have to be a starving artist, you know, the, the living in poverty, suffering for your, your, your passions, for your art. Um, but it's about finding a balance. And so for me, the priority of, of living a good life, of living a life where I feel like the world will be a better place for me having been in it and for me having worked in it, um, it, it holds a lot of weight. And so I just need to make enough money. Uh, and so for me, making enough money meant um, you know, living in Richmond, Virginia, where I grew up, which meant I had a good uh, safety net of, of people. I could do laundry at my parents' house if I needed to. Uh, there was you know, cheap food available, cheap rent available, um, cheap houses available, now that I own the house. Um, so you know, I, I set up a set of scenarios by which the way I wanted to live was viable. Um, and certainly if you want to have you know, 15 cars and a mansion, you're not going to uh, be able to just maybe work the way that I've been working. Um, so you know, it's about making those choices. Um, but it is possible. I mean, it's absolutely possible, and everybody in the book is doing it in a variety of ways. Um, but it is, again, I think about defining very clearly what it is that you want and what you want the outcome to be. Um, and, and you may find that you're already maybe partway there or most of the way there, and that it's you know, mostly a mindset uh, thing. To discover that you know doing living the way you want to live and the value of that is 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 like I say is success. Uh, and so if you can count you know that I've run my business my way uh, for all these years and I'm still continuing to do that and continuing to grow and do better, um, successful then yeah yeah you can do it. Great. And um, this next um, question really leads into that. Um, and it talks about how do you deal with clients who believe um, their work is you know in is a socially conscious type of work and that you should, you know, work for them for free. How do you how do you deal with that mentality? And I mean, I guess the bigger question is, you know, what types of strategies do you have for pricing work in a socially conscious manner? Yeah, that's a tough one. I and mean, we like I say we address it briefly in the book and it's it's a it, it's a big issue because you know, I think there is the mindset and sadly this is this is sort of an industry-wide mindset that like doing good as designers is this sort of side job that you do for free to make yourself feel better and so maybe and maybe to get some good portfolio pieces but that that's not your you know that's not your work and and sadly we've sort of educated nonprofits to believe that design work should be free uh, and what I you know I usually say to people about that is first of all take a look at the list of the most um, the largest nonprofits you know in the country and look at the salaries of their CEOs they get paid well there's some seven figure salaries out there so these aren't you know a nonprofit doesn't mean no profit so first of all, like you know, get your priorities straight and take a look at. Um, you can go online actually. And there's a couple of services like GuideStar where you can actually see um, how much. You know, the great thing about nonprofits is they're, they're, they have public uh, information, so you can go and see how much they make each year. You know, and then say to yourself, do do you think that um, it my service is valuable? Because what happens when you don't get paid for something is it's worth as much as you're paid. So it's worth nothing to people. Uh, and so when your work has value. Um, everybody, you know, benefits from it because you're going to care more about it, and they're going to care more about it, and so it's an it's an educational job on the part of the designer right now, and, and it may be for a long time. And so you kind of have to accept that as a socially conscious designer is that you're going to have to teach people why it's worth doing it. You know, I always say to clients, look, you can find people to do it for cheap, you can find people to do it for free. Um, if you want me to do it, and you like what I do, and the effect of the work that I do is powerful enough for you that, to want it, then you you should pay for it. And and here's why. And the reason is there are um, you know, a series of things that you're going to spend your money on as, as, as a nonprofit organization. And I'm obviously speaking specifically about nonprofits because they're generally the ones who are asking for, for free. Um, but if they say, you know, they say, oh, I want this for free, and it's like, well, look, you, you mostly want your money to pay for your, you know, the, the ability for you to have your service, which is great. But the second most important thing in your company is letting people know about your service, which actually is what we do is design and marketing. And so if the second most important thing in your company is valueless, that's a problem. And I think, you know, when you look at how a lot of nonprofits are run, you realize that they're not done very business-mindedly. And so, you know, we're helping to educate that this is a priority and the priority you should spend money on. And that, you know, I'm not asking for a ton of money for it. I'm asking for a reasonable rate. Um, 
And yes, you could get it done for free possibly uh, by a big uh, corporate design firm who spends their days making the world worse by, you know, I've seen this where like people got free, you know, pro bono advertising for their cause, but the company that did it was, was creating ads for products that were basically helping to create the problem that they were trying to solve. And so my thing is like, if we want the world to be a better place, then the people that are doing good things need to support each other. Uh, and some places are going to get that and some won't. And the, and the ones that don't, you know, I mean, that's your choice to work for them or not. But I basically say, sorry, you know, uh, and hopefully the people that are doing really good work will, will, will all speak about this together and then it will, will, will cause a sea change where that's not the expectation anymore. Look, the, you know, those nonprofits, they pay, pay for their rent, they pay for their electricity, they pay for their photocopies or whatever else, their computers, they can pay for this service too. They can afford it. Uh, it doesn't have to be a ton of money. You can start small. You can build them up. And I've definitely built clients up, started them small and said, okay, now my rate's this, now my rate's this. And, and knowing that my work was worth it, they paid for it. Uh, and they understood and they, re they appreciated the benefit of it. I, I do have a client who, who said they specifically turned down corporate work because they knew that I was going to corporate pro bono work for from a you know a corporate a large corporate uh, design firm because they knew I was going to care more about the subject and put more energy and effort into it. And I really appreciated that they trusted me to do that. Um, and it is a trust thing, so it's something you have to develop. Uh, so I mean that it's sort of a rambling answer, but but it's a tough topic. But I mean the answer is it's, it's education. Uh, and it's a willingness to stand your ground on this stuff and say, this is valuable. My work is valuable, and you need to pay for it. And, and here's why. Here's why it's valuable. Do you think that's also a willingness um, to say no as well if you know, the time comes to certain projects? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I definitely had to say no a few times in the beginning for people who were just doing things I didn't agree with. But in terms of financially, I've had to say to people that what, what you're looking to spend or not spend on this, I, I, you're better suited to a student, somebody who's just looking to build a portfolio right now. But even then, I have to say, you know, I, I have a list of former students and interns that I send projects mm -hmm. to. I almost always sell, uh, say to the people getting in touch with me saying, can you do this for free? I'll say, look, offer a little bit of money, you know, it, just to say thank you. Uh, it's not much, you know, if it's 50 or 100 bucks, that's more than zero. In fact, that's infinitely more than zero. Uh, and so, you know, when you offer that much, suddenly everybody's on board. You get a contract for that. You say, oh, here's what I'm agreeing to, which you should do with pro bono work anyway. But, you know, it just gives a value to it. And then what's great is you can say, well, this work is worth a lot more, but I'm giving it to you for this little amount. And so you've got to give me some freedom for that. And I, I did that a lot with my initial client saying, you know, my work was worth a lot, but I'm giving you a discount. So you got to give me some freedom to create great work to have portfolio pieces. And so, you know, then there was a trade-off and there was some fair, so, you know, a little more fair there because when, when it's just like, oh, we'll do this for free and do a million infinite changes to it. I mean, you're, no one cares what your opinion is anymore. Then you're just sort of a, a computer jockey and, and it's really a, a terrible position to be in. Pro bono, you know, nonprofit plan or just for anything. I mean, it's just, it's a really horrible situation. And, and like I said, I do some pro bono work, but it's very for very, very select clients who are what I call non, not non-profits, but no-profits. And often they may not even be formally a non-profit, they might just be a small group of volunteer individuals who I'm like, look, no one's making money, there is no budget, um, mm -hmm. my work will help them. That, that's worth me spending some time on, absolutely. But even then, I've often still gotten the benefit of, I've gotten, um, uh, I've, I've bartered uh, you know, for a local independent radio station with no budget, and I've done some design work and bartered for underwriting on the station, so I've got, you know, marketing for my company out of it. So even then, I can still get something from it. Um, and do you ever have an idea for a socially conscious project, um, but then, you know, go in reverse and try to seek out a potential client to take part in it? Um, yeah, I had this idea to make a book about this topic. <laughs> No, I mean, seriously, like, that's what it's like. I mean, absolutely, yeah, yeah. you know, if you've got an idea, um, and that's what we advocate, especially in the, in the going alone section, is that, you know, there's no reason that you have to wait for somebody else with money, and happily, it's mm -hmm. become a lot easier these days with things like Kickstarter and also Indie, in, Indiegogo is another one um, where you can, you know, crowdsource the funds. Now, admittedly, crowdsourcing is mostly going to be your friends to start, but um, Sometimes it doesn't take a lot of time or money to make things happen when you have an idea about it. And so a lot of it is just getting started and doing it and just making stuff. Um, but absolutely, yeah, if you've got the idea, um, seek out a partner. And what's cool is you can even come to people doing the subject already and say, look, I've got a cool thing that I think you should make, you know, and, and I, mm -hmm. I'm willing to do the work on it uh, if you guys are willing to find a budget for it. Uh, and I've had clients now come to me saying, look, there's an opportunity for a grant. Um, would you be interested in sort of developing a project around a grant? I was like, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm getting a ton of freedom, and if the grant comes through, you know, here's money to make something um, that the client knew to come to meet about that, which is really cool. They knew I was willing and, and interested in that. Okay, great. And, you know, this is a, a big question here to kind of end with. Um, 
And how important and how influential do you think designers can be in the world at large when it comes to this area? Uh, yeah, that is a big question. How influential can designers be? I mean, you know, look, here's the reality, right, is that, like, if you really want to make a difference in the world um, at a very sort of practical day-to-day -day level, like, maybe you don't need a job as a graphic designer. I mean, maybe you want to go work for the Peace Corps or go somewhere else. I mean, you know, we have to sort of be a little humble that, like, look, it's a job. And it's a job we like. I like doing graphic design. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't an enjoyable task. I love problem solving. I like making art and getting paid for it. So it's it's a great thing to do. Um, but it's a great thing to do that happens to have an incredible amount of influence. And influence in the sake that, like, you know, as again, I was talking to my Design Rebel students um, the other day about advertising because, of course, the, you know, the first thing that everyone says is, I'm not influenced by advertising. I, you know, that doesn't have an effect on me. And I said, well, Maybe, but you know, there's corporations spending billions of dollars every year in their advertising because they they've done the studies that show it does have an effect on you, and that you think it doesn't have an effect. So you know, I mean, design absolutely affects people and makes helps influence decision making, and especially when it's around topics that are super important. Um, you know, one of the examples that always gets brought up is the the classic um, butterfly ballot from Florida from the 2000 election, and the fact that um, basically you're looking at um, uh, you know poor design work. <laughs> and so on a very basic level, like, had that ballot been designed better, maybe more people would have voted for a different candidate, and maybe there would have been a different outcome. Uh, and that's a pretty huge thing. So, I mean, the effect, the potential of effect of design is huge. Uh, and so, yes, if every designer uh, was working from their personal ethic ethical perspective, again, not necessarily my ethics, but if they were working from an ethical perspective, thinking about the, the, the work they do, it will definitely have an effect. And even individual designers doing that, it does add up. And, and my only other evidence is that the world in the last 10 years has, has changed uh, significantly in a way that I didn't think it would um, doing this stuff because I expect activism to take a lot of time to be incremental. And so um, it's, it's having, I think, a more and more rapid effect. Um, so absolutely, uh, this is powerful stuff. There's an opportunity to make real change. Um, it's about making a personal choice to do it, uh, and it's about doing it yourself. You can't wait for other people to do it. You can't wait for the world to change around you. You have to be the, the person that makes the choice, that makes the change, that makes the difference. And you can. Well, thank you so much. That is a great way to you know, end this presentation, and we really appreciate um, your time on, on this a virtual book signing and on the book, um, and I'm going to go ahead and announce the winner of the copy of the Design Activist Handbook, um, and that winner is Tom Barber. So, um, Tom, I'll be following up with you via email. Um, if you were not chosen as a winner today, um, please keep your eye out for our follow-up email to this recording, which will have a link to the recording, and you'll also find information um, on you know where you can get your hands on the Design Activist Handbook, and we're offering a special um, exclusive promo promotion code um, valid for 15% off the book to all those who are listening um, today. So thank you so much for tuning in. And our next design tutorial will be coming up on Thursday, September 13th with Chris Butler. He'll be talking about Google Analytics for designers and using data to make design decisions. As always, you can go to howdesign.com and printmag.com to stay updated on future design tutorials, where you can also sign up for our e-newsletter to get additional discounts on books and products. Okay, that's it from us. Thanks for everyone for participating today and for the great questions. And thanks so much to you, Noah. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Have a great day.